Hello and welcome to Adventures in Local Marketing from Bright Local, the marketing podcast for marketers who want to do good local SEO. In the upcoming episodes, I'll be chatting with a smorgasbord of marketers who each bring their unique insight into the local marketing landscape. Each episode is going to serve up a one-stop overview of our guest's chosen topic area and it will offer tips and tactics that you'll be able to dash off and implement right away. I'm your host, I'm Claire Carlisle and I'm Bright Local's local search expert as well as a charters marketer with 20 years of experience of working with local businesses of all shapes and sizes. And today we will be chatting with the very wonderful Areej Abouali. Areej is the founder of Women in Tech SEO, which is a global digital marketing community. It was founded in 2019. Women in Tech SEO has over 10,000 global members and 60,000 followers who connect through online groups and in-person conferences in the UK, Europe, USA and Australia. Areej is an international speaker, a Google Women Tech Maker Ambassador and a UN Women UK Delegate. So, hello Areej and welcome to the show. Yeah, it's so good to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being here. We today are going to be talking about community and community building which I know is something that you know lots of things about. <laughs> yeah, I think so. A little bit here and there. I, I say it's a hard yes. So uh, let's just dive straight in. I always like to start with a bit of a beginner's mind question just to set the context for the conversation. Um, so in the context of marketing, what do we mean when we talk about community and community building? Yeah, I love that. I mean, even just taking a step back. So before we talk about marketing, you know, community is a gathering of people over some form of shared or common interest. Um, it's used a lot if you think about like within, you know, within one's neighborhood or within one's um, group of friends or family or so forth. Um, and usually people kind of like get together through a shared or common interest um, within marketing. It's this idea of, you know, how do we group folks who have similar interests with one another um, and help them connect more through having some form of like shared goal. Um, and I think what we're starting to see a lot is hear that term community marketing come to life um, where the, the whole concept is, well, how do we build a following or how do we grow our audience through the power of community? Um, because, you know, with like how fragmented in general, like all channels are becoming right now, community is one of the things that you have a lot of control over um, because, you know, you're speaking to your audience right there, right there. And it's just it makes it a lot easier for you to have this two way conversation with them. Something that that um, makes me think of um, when I was staying with a friend a long time ago and I was on my way to Brighton SEO and my friend um, was a, they imported uh, things from like sausages from Italy into the UK and I said, um, I'm going to go and meet up with my community, the SEO community. And it was uh, something that I was using very naturally a long time ago around the people that I didn't necessarily work with. They just were part of my industry. Um, and he he said, well, what do you mean your community? You know, we we he did, you know, and then that was the first time I realised that where we work and how we work and the type of industry that we're in, it, it does have that uh, community that isn't necessarily part of other industries so that was the first time that I noticed um, what you know how special I found uh, the industry and the niche that we were in um, so um, I found lots of different benefits of being um, in a community and part of a community but thinking about um, a brand um, why would they want to do it why do we see these sort of brand-led community initiatives uh, popping up what, what's in it for them 
Yeah, I mean, there is no easier way to actually have conversation or connect and understand the needs of your audience than through that community. A lot of times when you think about how we market something, it can feel very one way. So let's say we send out an email newsletter or we push something on social or we um, you know, run any form of advertising. It, it is very one way and it's very difficult for us to understand you know, what the feedback is of the back of that. But if you have a group of people who have a very common interest in your product, in your service, and you create that environment that they need to gather in that one place, you are able to then have that conversation and understand from them what is it that they're looking for? You know, what, what, what is it that they're missing? What are some of their needs? And you get a lot of that feedback directly and one-to-one. And it just, it makes things, you, you, this is who you're building for, right? And by, by not having that, there's a lot of assumptions that then tend to happen. Um, and yeah, of course, there are the typical things like running surveys or feedback or so forth. Um, but it's not the same from being able to tap into that network and, and know that, that, it's, that, that it's there. Um, and also, I feel like in general, like your audience is going to build a lot stronger, just like general loyalty, if they feel like they're part of something that they're benefiting from and that they're getting value from. Because it's not just about you giving them the value, but the beautiful thing that tends to happen in community is that the members just start giving value to one another. And you're just kind of there making sure that the environment is set and the and everything, you know, and the rules are in place and everything is like nice and organized. And then that's it. You just kind of step back and it's the members who then give each other value. So it makes it a lot. I remember I was having a chat with someone recently who used to work in the community team in HubSpot. And they gave this beautiful example of if one of our extremely active members decide that they want to leave HubSpot, they're not just leaving HubSpot as a product, but they're also leaving this community where they grew so many connections and such a massive network. And it makes it a lot more difficult to even make the decision at that point. Oh, I want to, this isn't a product, for example, that I want to be a part of. So yeah, you are, you know, you're giving them a lot of value by providing them with, with that space. That's brilliant. That you, I felt like you you covered all the angles there. Um, I want to say thank you to Jenny uh, from uh, Bright Local, who runs the uh, various communities and the local pack on Facebook, um, because she had uh, some really good uh, questions for you, which I will come to later, um, based on her experience of uh, running a community, um, which is just like a it's a totally different angle if you haven't you know, you've been involved in a community, so you know what's in it for you. But then when you set out to do that on behalf of like a brand or an organisation, there are so many different parts, um, including platform choice, you know, so many different parts of that. Um, I am super keen to have some examples um, of communities that have been built by uh, local brands, if you can think of them, and um, any other brands as well. We've had HubSpot already. That was obviously, we've got Women in Tech SEO, um, as we're a well-known community, uh, and we'll come to that later. But yeah, give us some examples, if you will. Yeah, I love that. So I mean, the most local example that comes to mind is, so my, uh, like my gym personal trainer, for example, they, it is in essence a community, a community that's built here locally that has three PTs, so three personal trainers, and then they gather all their clients in this WhatsApp community group so that we can all like interact with one another. They always market themselves as very community led. It's not just about going and doing, a, you know, having a PT session in the gym once a week. It is also about like the connections that you make with the other clients. And even though everyone, I think there's maybe like, I don't know, 40, 50 of us, it's very, very local, only based in this town that I'm in, but the conversations we have all the time, and even though everyone's like at another level, but it's, you know, let's, an example is someone might go like, I'm going for a run tomorrow. Does anyone want to join me? Um, and someone might ask for food recipes or suggestions or la la la. When you think about it, the actual PTs, they're not actually in like answering all the questions all the time, but they've given us this community, this space, and it makes it very, very strong. And 
actually one of the things that always crosses my mind is, you know, even if down the line I feel like I no longer want to work with my PT, I don't want to miss out on this community and this wonderful group of people that I now connect with where we have a shared goal. We all happen to live in the same place and we all happen to want to exercise. So I think that's a really good example of a very, very local business that does, it's just, it's so unique. It's such a unique selling point as opposed to just going and signing up with a PT in the gym and that's it. They don't, they don't sell you that. They sell you being part of a community. Um, and I think it would be it, just amazing to see more of these examples start cropping up because I understand that it feels like this is a lot of time, resource, money, energy, but the simplicity of how you can set something like this up and for it to be really valuable and, and make a difference, you know, for your clients or your audience or the group of people who are benefiting from the service um, is massive. And then if I were to think then on the other hand, like of a bigger example, so Buffer comes to mind. I have so much love for Buffer. Um, they're a, yeah, like a social media platform where you can aggregate all your social media platforms and be able to like schedule posts and so forth. Buffer was purely built on community, like from its very, very early days. And um, I had just the complete honor of like talking and chatting a lot with their founder, Joel, for um, for my book. And he, the amount of insights that he gave me were just second to none. And one of the things he said is when he first started out, like as, you know, as a co-founder, he would reach out every single time someone would sign up he would reach out to them one-to-one -one and just understand, oh, why have you signed up to Buffer? Tell me more about what you do. What is it that you're interested in? How can this platform help you? And because of that mindset from the beginning, I mean, now, like, they're, you know, they're, they're a massive, massive company, but community is always at the heart of what they have. They've always, and they went through different iterations. They had a really active Slack community, and then they switched over to Discord, and they've always, like, tried different things, but... One of the things that happen when you join Buffer and then you join their community is right away, like the it asks you a question, you know, are you, um, I think, do you work for yourself? Do you work in a company? Are you agency? La, la, la. And you choose where you're based and then it helps you go on that journey and like be part of channels where you can connect even easier with people in there. And of course, what it meant from for them is when they're for the product team, for example, if they want to sit down and they want to prioritize what's going to be on the roadmap for the next quarter or the next year. They don't, they don't need to, they literally have a community of people that can help them make those decisions and can help them prioritize what it is that they're looking for. Um, and Joel says it really good where he, I think he gave this example. He doesn't want to be, he doesn't want to have one of those companies where you have to, uh, in order to get feedback from your users, you need to like tell them, I'm going to give you like a $10 Starbucks voucher or whatever. People are so ingrained in the community that they want to give that feedback and they want to give that time and energy back without asking for anything back because they will be so excited that they're part of that decision process. So yeah, like two very, very different examples, but I think together they kind of bring some of the, yeah, the value that can come out of it and how it can be done on a very, very small scale, but also be done on like a much larger scale. Perfect. Like you say, two very different examples. And one of the things that you um, touched on in there is to do with um, platforms. So, you know, you mentioned WhatsApp, um, you've mentioned Slack, you've mentioned Discord. Um, and I know that we'll probably come to that in a minute, but I'm thinking about, um, so if a brand is uh, thinking they want to uh, you know, start thinking about building a community because hopefully they'll do lots of thinking <laughs> before they actually crack on and build something. Um, where where would they start? Maybe what are some of the, the questions that they need to ask themselves before they um, actually make any moves? Where should they start from? Yeah, I mean, I love that. And I think one of the, you, it's very similar to like when you're starting out a company or so forth. And I think a lot of that time also needs to be spent before you start out like a community. So really thinking and understanding, you know, what is, what is your vision behind it and what is your mission behind it and what is it that you're trying to achieve on the long term and what is it that you're trying to do in the next, um, you know, 12 months or so forth. But then also like, what are the values that you need to have to back up that community? And a lot of the times when it's a company or a brand-led community, 
you need to make sure that there's alignment with your, you know, company culture and your company values, or else it's just, it's not, it's not going to feel right. And something will always feel off. And, you know, you will have all your team of people always being part and ingrained in this community. And this community says a lot and speaks volumes about like your actual company culture. So you want to make sure that it, it is aligned and it just feels a lot more natural. Um, and the other thing I would add to that is just from the, from the beginning, something I always say, like, you need to have, you know, that those rules and that code of conduct set from the very, very beginning, because being proactive as opposed to reactive, even at the start, you might just have like a handful of people come in, but they need to make sure that they feel safe and they feel cared for and that they're not in a group that's a little bit all over the place or can make them feel overwhelmed or so forth. So if you spend the time and energy to set this stuff up front and you have, it's very easy for you to fall back to it as well. Because, you know, if down the line, especially like as you scale, if any challenges arise or any problems happen, you are able to hold on to, you know, those rules and code of conduct that you set, but also you're able to also continuously be thinking about the different initiatives and projects and so forth that you're working on and be like, oh, is this aligned with, you know, the main vision behind what we're trying to achieve here? Or does this tick our values, um, does it feel right for us to, to do something like that? So I think those for me come first before thinking about platform, because, you know, like the, the, the technical elements of like deciding what platform you're going to go for, and maybe even deciding to change it down the line, like that, I feel like that stuff is actually the easy part, but it's like that stuff up, up top is probably what makes it a little bit more challenging and can feel really overwhelming to like start something. Um, but just also remembering like, you know, this stuff can change. It doesn't have to be set in stone. Um, and when you, when you're putting that stuff together, you, you still don't have members that you can kind of get their feedback from, but down the line, as you go through like any changes or you're growing and you're scaling, my advice is to always involve your members into that so that they, fe they feel like they're in the know and they feel like this stuff isn't just not being communicated and happening in the background. Fabulous. Um, because you have uh, just touched on like guides, a question about enforcing rules, uh, making sure people adhere to the guidelines, um, but without like limiting or block blocking people's ability to share and connect. So can you tell us a little bit about, you know, is that walking a line or is it hard or is it easy? T tell us some things about that, please. Yeah. So, I mean, firstly, love Jenny so much and absolutely brilliant. So, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, you know, that's one of the hardest parts, like dealing with the actual challenges that might arise and it's, it takes up a lot of time and energy and you want to make sure that you're modeling it and you're modeling it right. And you're, I think my, uh, and it took me some time to personally realize this is like, you cannot make everyone happy and that's perfectly okay. Um, you know, you will have rules in place that might not everyone might feel aligned with or not every some people might feel this is too strict this is unnecessary but you know what's right for your community and you know what's right for your members to feel like they're taken care of so just being okay with you're not going to make everyone happy and that's okay uh but also like modeling that behavior so i always talk about like being proactive as opposed to reactive and what i mean by that is if you feel even if let's say a question or a discussion point got posted and that on its own does not actually break any of the rules, but you just know that some comments might come in place that may end up breaking those rules, then, you know, just be proactive upfront, um, have a discussion with the member that posted it and just be honest and explain, you know, your post has not actually broken any rules, but there is the worry that, you know, there might be comments that come through that may be problematic, in which case we, we, we want to be proactive about this. We don't want to wait until that happens for us to then. So could you possibly edit your post uh, with a reflection of la 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 or just something around those lines? And then I think when, if you, uh, first of all, like people have different things in place and it's up to, but communicating that from the front. So uh, women in tech SEO, we remove someone who breaks the rule, full stop. I mean, we, it's just how we do things and we, but we are upfront about that. And then there are other communities that have like a warning system in place. 
So, you know, you could have something along the lines of, uh, you know, awareness, education, then, you know, taking action. So awareness is where you make sure that you are informing every one of your rules. And you that's something very critical to do up front. Like when you onboard a new member, you have a new member come in. Um, also making sure that the, that material is readily available. You're always reminding older members about it. These are our rules. These are our rules. Um, and then education is, you know, if someone... Um, if someone breaks one of those rules or kind of like is around it, then you, you know, you have a one-to-one -one with them and you explain what just happened and you give them that warning. Um, and then the third step would be taking action. So if that happens again, then, you know, you could take action of like removing them from the, so that's like one model, but I mean, people would, as long as you communicate that upfront and you explain how it works for you, um, then I think that th that should be fine. And then the other thing I just want to mention is like how you can model, like how can you take those learnings and use that as like a learning opportunity for the rest of the community? So something I tend to do a lot is, let's say we had a specific problem happen in the group and it ended up in the removal of, of someone. It's, it's then no, you know, no need to kind of name the person or explain the scenario or so forth, but it's about then sharing with the rest of the community, you know, something around that happened. And for that, we have decided, because this could happen, we have decided to add a new rule. And this rule is this, and it's going to be enforced from today. So it's kind of, you're taking your learnings and you're sharing them publicly with the rest of the members um, and the action that you've decided to take off the back of it. And that's a really good way of kind of like modeling that behavior. And again, reiterating that reminder of, you know, we have those rules in place and everyone needs to be following them. That's perfect. I was just about to ask you a question about iterations of guidelines. And if you had found that, um, you know, they had grown organically as, as you went along. Um, have you removed, was there anything that you, you felt that very strongly about that was a part, was a guideline that then you didn't, you removed or you didn't need to include anymore or mm. how? Do... <laughs> yeah, no, I love that. I, I, I honestly, I, I think it just keeps growing. <laughs> I don't think we've removed anything in the last five years, but, but I know it, it has definitely, we've definitely added new rules and those have been added off the back of, just, you know, getting a, a brand new experience happen and being like, oh, wow, this, we hadn't even considered that. And I remember, for example, we, for the longest time, we didn't have anything in our community code of conduct that talks about, um, you know, not, not mentioning anything around politics. We, we didn't have that because that conversation never cropped up and there was no expectation for it to crop up in like a, com a marketing community. But then when it did one time, we were like, oh, wait, this doesn't sit right. This doesn't feel right. You know, this might be problematic. And so, you know, we added, we had to like add or make an amend around that. Um, and then we went and communicated that with our members and we explained, you know, the need of us adding that and why we felt like this isn't, um, this isn't something that's like related to our collective goals as a, as a group. So yeah, it's, uh, we ha I wouldn't say we've removed anything, but we, we definitely do add and we, it's, it's something that I feel needs constant revisiting. And also we wouldn't necessarily just add based on how we feel about some stuff that's being, but based on feedback from members. So we might have a member come up to us and say, you know, they're uncomfortable with this or they're not too, you know, this situation happened or, and so off the back of that, we might then make a decision to, you know, make an amendment or, or add something in the code of conduct. Thinking a little bit about, um, so there's a couple of questions thinking about how to make sure that everyone can have a voice and that you get the engagement that you want. So um, thinking about um, a, a brand itself, building trust with the community. Um, and I think you sort of touched on this in a way that engages the community on their level rather than in a very heavy handed authoritative way. Um, any tips on that based on what you've just said about guidelines? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's 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 definitely it's this idea of how do you help foster those conversations between the members organically? Um and I mean it's it's a, at, at the very beginning, of course, you will have to do a lot of work and it will feel fairly quiet. And there is always this buzz that happens, you know, people join in a brand new community, they get excited, they introduce themselves and then that's it they're gone, you know, they, but it's because they don't feel they have a reason to, to stick around. They, they don't quite know how. And in any community, like a large portion of it might be made from, you know, folks who are just like listening in. 
So they're seeing conversations here and there, and maybe they don't necessarily in interact, which is why you, you, know, you need to make sure that you're introducing different initiatives and projects that could potentially like cater for people across the board, um, which helps them. There has to be like value from, from what they, they get through that. The more you involve your community members in the way that you run and build a community, the more active they're going to become. I think it's as simple, like it's literally as simple as that. And so if they don't feel like they have any decisions or any say in how something is running or like this group that they're a part of, then they'll, you know, they, they won't feel like they need to stick around. So I feel like for brands, this is something to consider where how can you constantly be getting their feedback asking questions, you know, asking just those even really, really easy questions. And uh, uh, that a lot of that can be done up front as well when you're still getting this engagement. You know, what is it that you're looking for? What kind of meetups do you want us to host? Um, what kind of content pieces would you find helpful? Um, does anyone want to, you know, volunteer to run um, uh, uh, like a round table for freelancers? It just things like that where you are involving your members in every decision and then people get really, really excited to be a part of it at that point. And I think specifically when it comes to like any guidelines or code of conduct or so forth, it's it's just about like communication and making sure that they're, they're a part of that decision as well. And always having this like open door policy of... Uh, We've made this decision and it's done, but we also really want to hear your feedback on it. Like if anyone feel, I always end anything I share, I think with, you know, if you have any thoughts or feelings on this, please, please come to me, let me know. Um, and I answer every single like one-to-one -one DM that comes through because if this is the, you need to make sure you, you keep them involved because like, you know, without, if your members come in and then they feel you've put them in this group just to sell to them, they're going to leave. Like it's, it's, it is as simple as that. Um, so what, you know, what is the value that they're, that they're getting from it? So any top tips for engagement and driving engagement advice on celebrating the most, you know, the, the ones with the biggest voices, but also encouraging the quieter speak, uh, uh, quieter people to speak up. Yeah. I mean, I, I think both are equally important. So we, if you think about the makeup of a community, probably the ones who are fairly quiet, make up a much larger portion than the ones who are a lot more active. Um, and that's okay because they are both equally important. I mean, even the listeners, they might be going in and kind of like listening in different conversations and every now and then they might decide to jump in and um, because they are getting value from it, they want to give that value back and like answer a question or 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 share a job opportunity that helps other get hired or just give guidance or support so it could be it could be anything and definitely don't only focus on one but make sure that you're um you're giving a lot of love and attention to to both i think specifically with active members is how to celebrate them even by thanking them giving them credit um you know making sure they formulate like your core group of people who can give feedback on how things are running um a lot of brands have something around like a, a community ambassador program for example which is usually made up of very very active uh, members who can then help give a lot of guidance on how you know how to shape up the future of that community or how to continue working on it um but also i feel like with the, with the quiet ones it's also it's just about checking in. So I feel like what tends to happen a lot when you onboard a new member, and even if people have a good onboarding system in place, you know, they come in, they say, welcome, they give you an introduction, and then that's it. So something we try to do is, well, how do we continue those touch bases? Maybe you don't want to overwhelm them with a lot of information up front. So you give them a chance to come in, they do their introduction, they, they, they familiarize themselves with the place. And then maybe a week or two later, you check in and you ask them, you know, how are they feeling about stuff? How are they finding this? Is, do they have any questions? Um, something we're actually considering trialing out is almost like a buddy system where how can you pair up those really active members with those quiet ones? Um, but also another thing in general that I talk a lot about is this idea of like giving and taking. So I think this is a good reminder to keep giving your members, which is, you know, any community will only thrive and continue as is if members are both giving and taking. So giving as in, you know, they're providing support, they're answering questions, they're stepping in, they're welcoming others. And then taking, which is, you know, they're soaking in these this information and they're getting opportunities and so forth. 
So I feel like that reminder, and then you give a bunch of examples um, of how, you know, how someone can give and take. And I feel by constantly like pushing those reminders as well, very similar to that guidance and code of conduct and so forth, it helps cement it in people's minds. And you'll find, I find that a lot now, which I, you know, maybe someone asks a question, right after they ask a question, they go in and answer another one because they want to feel like they are both giving and taking. So reminders like that are always really, really helpful. And um, I think that especially with regard to the um, if you're a more being a person that's more quiet, sometimes that can come from um, maybe that you don't feel very. Um, yeah, you don't you don't feel very confident uh, within what you're saying, especially answering people's questions. So I guess that having um, those community guidelines um when you when you're in women in tech it's like well there aren't silly you know there aren't silly questions you don't need to preface everything yeah. with this might be a silly question it's a question it's a real question and it, yeah. it, there has it's it, you know it's something that you would like to know the answer to so i think just knowing that you're in a a, a you know a, a kind space where you can ask the things mm -hmm. that you need to ask without someone making a judgment on your knowledge or lack of knowledge mm -hmm. or lack of, you know, whatever. I think that's super important as well, because otherwise um, you won't ask or answer if you are worried that people are going to, you know, react in not a very kind way <laughs> to what you're saying. And I, I think what I especially like about when we added that rule as well, it was because a lot of people were starting their questions by saying, oh, sorry if that's a stupid question, sorry if that's a... And what happened is because of how many times I would constantly send that reminder, I don't even have to do that anymore. So I would log in and I'd find that someone asked a question with that. And another member responded by reminding them, by the way, one of our rules is there's no such thing as a stupid question. Or even every now and then I might get a DM directly like, uh, Arij, I feel like this post is off and isn't, you know, is, is against our code of conduct. Could you take a look at it? So you're almost having your community members do the work. They are helping build it and keep it safe and keep it value aligned with you, the more embedded they, they become. And that does not happen naturally. That happens through just a lot of iteration and a lot of repetition and a lot of modeling of, you know, of how some of this stuff is set into place. Um, and, and over time, just it's, it, it just clicks for people and they understand this is what it's like to be in this space. Mm -hmm. I'm going to think a little bit now about, um, measuring success or measuring return because I can imagine that a lot of organizations might be thinking goodness gracious me that sounds like a lot of work there's a lot of internal resource apart from the external resource that you might need to put into your platforms um, mm -hmm. and other things assets you, you've got this you know you, you're going to need to use people to to answer these questions yeah. so one the objective, the audience and all those parts of the community is important. Is this a for profit? You know, am I monetizing this? Is this something mm -hmm. that sits uh, is a free part that sits alongside and is a value add to an existing product or service? So any organization will have thought of those things beforehand. So they've got their objectives, I would hope. Um, so obviously, there's different parts of that. There's I imagine that if it's um, if it's a paid for, you'll be looking at revenue. What are the other parts that um, mm -hmm. organizations can think about? Ah, okay, um, these are the things that I can actually measure. These are going to be my KPIs around whether or not this has been a good investment and is meeting the objectives. Yeah, so I mean, there's so many, so many parts in this question, but I think the first thing I want to say is I'm glad you touched on monetization because that's probably one of the first things as well alongside, you know, setting, you know, setting your vision mission up and setting your code of conduct and knowing what platform you're going to use and so forth. It is, you know, making, understanding what that monetization model looks like. And to be honest with most brand, like the majority of brands who go out and set up a community, it wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily be something that is like paid for. It might be something that's only reserved for their users, or it might be something that's even more open, right? Because it helps bring potentially new users through, through the board. So I think having a think about this and about, you know, what, it, what is the objective? Is it about, is it about client retention or, or is it about bringing brand new clients through the door? Because those can feel very, very different. And you could create a community that caters for both, 
or you could create one that only focuses on one. So I think just kind of bearing that in mind and making a plan around it up front. And then the second thing I want to know, like, it's not, I feel like there's always this effort of, oh, we have to create this, we have to do this. And I talk about partnership a lot because you don't necessarily need to be the one that starts the community from scratch. What you could do instead is you could go partner up with communities that have exactly your client base and your audience that you're looking for. That's already set up, that's already established, that already has its code of conduct, that already has its engaged members. And all you do is you, you, you have those common values and you have those common goals and you work with them in a way where, you know, you tick some of those KPIs that you have. And my advice usually is that you should do that first before you even commit to starting your own community. Because firstly, you'll learn a lot about community marketing at that point, and you will learn about you know, how powerful of a tool it is. Maybe it's something for you, maybe it's something that's not. You'll learn from the way it's organized and it's set up, and you can then off the back of that, off the back of partnering with an active community, then make the decision, well, I actually wanna go ahead and set up my own community, or you might decide this, this is great. Maybe I should partner up with more communities and more events and like leverage this as much as I can. So that, that, it, that is also a consideration to have in place for like a company or a brand. And then I think thirdly, when it comes to like the actual KPIs that you set, I mean, there's always going to be like quantitative and qualitative ones. So the quantitative, exactly like you mentioned, it could be, you know, how many members have come through the door, how many have actually converted um, how many are active, like you, your, your percentage of active members, how many questions are answered, how many messages are shared a month. So a lot of that are very just like uh, more around numbers, but then the qualitative ones are about, you know, what, what feedback has come through the door that imp directly impacted my product roadmap. Um, were my were my user, you know, my, like my UX designers, were they able to get on calls with, with members and get those answers that they want without having to talk about a $50 Starbucks card or whatever? And it's, those are like, those qualitative measures are just so key and so important for, and th they make a massive difference. And it's like, and how much are, you know, do we, for me, I think one of the things I like biggest win we ever had for WTS is actually having people meet there and decide to like found the company together. There is no, no, no KPI ever would measure like having that impact on people meeting in the community and deciding to start their own company together. For me, that, that, that will always be like one of the biggest wins. So I think it's things like that. Like it's this idea of what stories can be shared off the back of the members that you have in this space that you've created that people will go and talk about. Because those stories, this is exactly what speaks volume about your community. It isn't necessarily, I've got 5,000 members or 8,000 members or, or, or so forth. So yeah, I think a number of things here, but just making, um, and when you, it is, it, it, it's not, it, it is an investment and it does take up a lot of time. Um, and I think, you know, if you, I've spoken to brands and companies who initially started off by just having uh, this one person who does email, social, community, la la, right? And it's, it's, it happens, right? Because a lot of companies can be tight on, on budget and resource and so forth. But once you start understanding the scale of it and you decide that this is something that you want to prioritize, it's also then understanding, well, what would that department potentially look like and who could lead it and who could look after it, but also pulling in. Um, so Sanity are a great example, uh, like a, a CMS with a thriving, thriving community of developers. They hire most of their community um, team members through the community itself, through extremely active community members. So just knowing that, you know, you could leverage how active your members are who are already so ingrained in your product and your community and have them be part of the team is, is something to definitely consider as well. Mm -hmm. I love that. Thank you. Um, Arij, um, have you written a book? <laughs> I have written a book. Thankfully, it's done. What is it? What was it? 80,000 words or I don't know anymore. It was many, many it words. It was the hardest thing words. I've ever worked on. Can yeah. you tell us the title and a little bit about the book, please? Yeah. So the book is called Community Building for Marketers, um, and it's going to be published by Kogan Page on March 3rd, which is so exciting. Um, and it, it goes through those three stages of uh, 
um, like creating a community, growing a community and scaling a community. And it covers a lot of the things and the themes that we just talked about. Uh, but also I'm not, you know, I, I learned everything on the go. Like I started my community as a passion project five years ago and I just, I was learning as I went. And so what I wanted to make sure I do with this book specifically is talk to a lot of brilliant community experts. So I had just the most amazing honor to interview folks from HubSpot and Sanity and Buffer and the TFL org and just a lot more companies and learn from their learnings and so share a lot of those and embed them within within the book as well so yeah like the hope for the book is it would be very very helpful for community builders whether they are even considering starting a community or ones that are already further along in their journey and that it has something for for everyone in terms of you know the importance of community marketing and um and how this really will be the thing that I think a lot of companies and brands will start to realize they need to put a lot of time and energy and resource in over the over the next few years because it is something that they can fully control and these are conversations that they want to make sure that they're having all the time. I think that's absolutely perfect because normally when we end up finishing a, uh, a a podcast recording, I say, you know, if you're interested in the subject matter, where should you go to? And this is the ultimate mm -hmm. answer to this. This is like, oh, the idea of uh, building a community around my brand has definitely piqued my interest. Hmm, where could I go and find out about that? And it's like, I've written a book and you can pre-order it yes. now uh, and you can get hold of that. So I've pre-ordered and I will be getting my copy in March and I'm very excited about it. So you mentioned um, a few that you had the chance to talk um, to people that had, you know, um, inspired you, people that you admire. Um, can you give us a couple of shout outs for other um, community builders um, so um, our listeners and our watchers can go out and follow those people and listen to what they have to say, please? Yeah, of course. I'd love to. I mean, Christina Garnett comes to mind. Like Christina is brilliant, um, but took part in building so many communities and just amplifies and supports everyone. Very lucky to have her in our advisory board at WTS. Um, and yeah, jo Joel, so Buffer's co-founder is just uh, like out of this world. I've never, when I think of community, I think of Buffer and everything they've done and like the time that he's given me and kind of sharing a lot of like his insights has just been tremendously helpful. Um, and then thinking of communities within our space, so within the marketing space, specifically digital marketing, um, there's just so many to shout out. So I want to give a massive shout out to FCDC that's run by Shima, um, the work that they do. So that's freelancers for developing countries and they are set up as a nonprofit and the amount of mentorship and support that they provide for lots of folks who want to get into the digital marketing world is, is just, just second to none. Um, and then there's a lot of like new communities that keep cropping up, which I love to see. So Lazarina just started her Women in Marketing Bulgaria. Um, and it's just beautiful to see they're doing a lot of ways to connect in person and support one another. And you see that happening. It's like this idea of like mar micro communities that need to be even more niche because they want to connect through culture and language and those shared interests are even more important than just connecting over the fact that they're within the same industry. Um, I've seen that happening with Latinas in SEO, uh, which was formed by a group of brilliant WTS members. And they're, um, again, a lot of their focuses are on language and, and culture as well within the SEO industry. Um, one of the communities that I uh, just I get so much value from is uh, the DMU, so that's the Digital Marketing Union, um, which is for freelancers um, who uh, a lot of us are based in the UK uh, within digital marketing and just the amount of insight that you you get from that for from connecting with you know people within the same area who have the same. So yeah, we you're right. I think what you said at the start with going to Brighton SEO and saying you know I'm I'm about to go meet my community. We are. I would say that's something that I absolutely love about our industry in general is we are very community led and there's no there's no shortage at all of and people always have, you know, the energy and the, they get inspired seeing one and they decide to start their own if they can't find what they're looking for. And I, I just I, I think that's beautiful. And I think that's only going to keep growing. And so for companies and brands, like the first thing to do is tap into these communities, partner up with them, support them and see how you can, um, you know, make sure that there's like a, there's a win win happening on both sides. And then, you know, start your own 
um, community if you feel the, the need to do that and to make sure that you're bringing in the right people and you're and you're helping retain your your client base as well. Thank you. So I need to say a big thank you to you for being our guest today. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your insight. A big thank you for Women in Tech SEO, which is you know important to so many people that I know and that I work with. Um, so huge thank you to Areej and a big thank you to you, our listeners and our watchers. We will make sure that we include all of the links, including the links to Areej's book that we talked about today in the show notes. Um, so check those out if you want to follow up and learn more. So that is it for another Adventures in Local Marketing. And sadly, this is the last episode that I'll be hosting because I will be moving on to Pastures New and some exciting new adventures. I have actually loved sharing expert insights, getting to the heart of local SEO and having fun and fantastic conversations with fabulous people for the last 16 episodes. So thank you to everyone that's been on the podcast with me. Um, Adventures in Local Marketing will be back with a new host next year. And who knows, I might even get to be a guest and you can learn what I put in my room 404. So thank you, Areej. Goodbye. And goodbye to all of our lovely listeners. Bye, my lovely. Thank you.